I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. In the 1960s, an impossible dream came true when human beings walked on another world. The eagle has landed. In all, 24 Americans went to the moon. But it took an unseen army of over 400,000 engineers and technicians to make it possible. This is the story of the men and women who built the machines that took us to the moon. the 1950s and early 60s, the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States took an ominous turn which shocked the American people. Wait a minute. They put a satellite in orbit around the Earth? I think I said something like, golly gee, son of a gun. I didn't really say it that way, but similar. A group of us actually climbed to the top railings of the test stands and watched Sputnik go over as a white dot going across the sky like a meteor. And of course, all it was doing was going beep, 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 beep. <laughs> but hey, they put it up there, you know. The new strategic high ground was space. And the Russians continued to chalk up an impressive list of firsts. They had launched the first man. Yuri Gagarin, they had uh, launched the first lady, and they were really in all areas way ahead of us. So we said, we better get cracking. The Russian space program called for a response. In May 1961, President Kennedy galvanized the American people with an audacious challenge, to reach for the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. I was so proud of him, I was jumping out of my pants, practically. I mean, uh, and I was so excited because I knew I was gonna be able to be a part of it. I didn't realize the magnitude of the challenge uh, or the, some of the technical requirements, but I still felt that, you know, we could do anything at that time. We were all young. We didn't know what failure meant, and we knew we could do it. Reality sets in for a moment and say, well, how are we going to do that? Ten years? That's a short time. And so uh, it was a mixture of exhilaration and, and um, maybe even depression to think about how you're going to do this. To many, Kennedy's goals seemed almost impossible. But the president knew more than he was letting on. The key to his confidence lay in a small town in Alabama. In the 1950s, Huntsville was a sleepy little town. When I first came here, the population was about 18,000 people. Soon, uh, we newcomers outnumbered the old, old timers. It was, it was a happy time. Among the newcomers was an unlikely group of people with a valuable set of skills, German rocket engineers. Led by Werner von Braun, the Germans had already mastered the basics of rocket propulsion. During World War II, they built the V-2, the world's first ballistic missile. Engineer Conrad Dannenberg. When we came to the United States, we brought with us uh, the V-2, all the plans for the V-2. The people in the United States were very impressed by the capability of the V-2. The, 
this technology was very important for the growth of the space program because these engines are more efficient, they can be controlled, and you really have a capability to work with your engines during your flight. The German people who came over were indeed very skilled people. They were, all of them, dedicated to rocketry and wanted to continue that, not from the standpoint of having rockets to launch on enemies, but the whole thing behind their thoughts was going, uh, going into space, going to the moon. With the Russians leading the space race and America desperate to catch up, von Braun saw an opportunity to fulfill his lifelong dream. Von Braun was always thinking in the back of his head, we're going to the moon. That's what he wanted to do. And it infused everybody. We all wanted to go to the moon. All you had to do was talk to him five minutes and you're ready to go. He was very charismatic. You know, he could sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Von Braun turned his persuasive skills on the new president. And that, of course, was what eventually led uh, President Kennedy to announce a trip to the moon. I'm sure he had been influenced by Werner von Braun. Even before Kennedy's announcement, von Braun's team was designing a family of rockets they called Saturn. First on the pad was the Saturn I, almost 200 feet tall and with a thrust of 1.5 million pounds. When it lifted off, the engineers could not suppress their excitement. The Saturn I successfully demonstrated the key technique, which would be vital in building a much larger moon rocket. This was the concept of staging, in effect stacking multiple rockets one on top of the other. If, if you tried to go to orbit with all one stage, the amount of fuel and the size of the engines required would have to push the entire weight of that first stage to that full velocity. They learned that through analysis that the best way to do it was to get to orbit using multiple stages. So that the first stage would give you a certain amount of what they call delta V, change in velocity from zero to certain speed. And then you would drop off that whole stage, all of its tanks, all of its engines, and all the weight associated with it. So the second stage had much less mass to push. But to go beyond Earth's orbit would require more than two stages. And when you do the calculations, the most efficient way to build a moon rocket one to get to the moon turned out to be a three-stage vehicle. On paper, the three-stage concept looked like this. Stage one would have a cluster of five engines, the likes of which had never been built before, called the F-1. On liftoff, each one would need to burn almost three tons of fuel a second just to lift the enormous rocket off the pad. Stage two would also cluster five engines, the smaller J-2. The third stage would use a single J-2 engine, which would have to fire more than once, to place the elements of the Apollo spacecraft first into Earth's orbit and then on a course to the moon. When assembled, it would be the largest flying machine the world had ever seen. On paper, the Saturn V was capable of taking men to the moon. But could drawings be successfully turned into reality? The first stage of the giant rocket would be the largest. It needed to provide the initial thrust to lift the vehicle off the pad to a height of around 35 miles. The cluster of F-1 engines designed to do this would require a huge leap forward in technology. Although they'd only burn for two and a half minutes, the pipes and valves would have to withstand immense pressures and temperatures. 
If successful, it would be the largest liquid-fueled engine ever flown. To oversee its production at the newly formed Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Von Braun turned to a young engineer called Sonny Morea. He gave me the responsibility for a $1 billion program, $1 billion in those dollars, not today's dollars. And he picked on this young guy who was 28 years old, didn't have very much experience, and gave me the challenge of being the manager of that program. Greatest decision that I think the man could make. <laughs> Building such a large rocket engine would also require a test facility on a similar scale. When you fire the, the first stage engines of the Saturn V, you develop seven and a half million pounds of thrust. That's tremendous kinetic energy coming out of those exhausts. And of course, you couldn't let it project the exhaust directly in the ground because pretty soon your test stand would fall over. So instead, you use a flame bucket to catch the exhaust gases and then deflect them outward. The huge amounts of energy unleashed posed problems for those living nearby. Under certain weather conditions, the shock waves from the engines would become trapped close to the ground and travel a long way cross country. In fact, the first few firings, we were breaking windows in downtown Huntsville, which is over the hills to the rear here. And uh, we knew we couldn't keep doing that very long or we we're gonna lose the support for the space program in the city of Huntsville. But the tests had to continue. And they soon revealed something unforeseen was happening as the fuel burned in the combustion chamber. One of the big problems we ran across was the problem of combustion instability. And by that, we were dealing with, with uh, rotation of the flame of the burning process within the thrust chamber of like 2,000 cycles a second. The rapidly rotating flame could destroy the whole engine in a matter of seconds. It was a showstopper, there was no question about it. We had to find a way to make the engine run stable. The thing that, that was so overwhelming to me was that unless we solved this problem, we would not be going to the moon with a man. Combustion instability took thousands of man hours and many agonizing months to solve. Keep in mind that back in those days, uh, we were designing rocket engines basically with slide rules. The answer lay in the way the fuel was injected into the combustion chamber. The solution to the problem is shown by that series of copper baffles that you see on the face of the injector. And that particular arrangement baffled the oscillations so that we now had stable combustion. So it was a very nice, unique solution to a very serious problem that was a big showstopper in the program, had it not been solved. With the construction of the first stage well underway, the building of the second fell to the engineers at North American Aviation in California. Stage two was a technical challenge of the first order. We had some unique manufacturing problems. We had interesting design problems. And um, it was probably the biggest challenge of the, of the Saturn V. The main headache for the Stage Two team was that the Apollo spacecraft, the command and lunar modules sitting on top of the Saturn V, kept getting heavier as their designs evolved. That inevitably meant that the rocket below them had to be made lighter. One of the engineers feeling the pressure was George Phelps. When they gave us a weight reduction problem, we said, well, it would take some out of the first stage, some out of the third stage and the second stage. No, the, the first stage is too far along, and so is the third stage. And so we got to take it out of the second stage. A radical solution was needed 
to shed weight from the second stage. Normally, two separate tanks stored the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen fuels, with a temperature difference between them of over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. At both ends of each tank was a strong, relatively heavy, dome-shaped bulkhead. So to save weight, somebody came up with the idea to eliminate one bulkhead. This was the biggest, I think, the biggest challenge on that stage, to have one bulkhead to separate the two fuels. The stage would now have only one tank, and the fuels would be separated by just one divider known as the common bulkhead. This arrangement had a double benefit. It got rid of one of the heavy bulkheads and it reduced the overall length of the stage. But it also meant that two liquids at vastly different temperatures were right next to each other. And we had a, a divider that was about that thick. That was the most difficult problem that we had to solve, but we did it, because engineers can just about do anything. <laughs> but the greatest temperature problem was not keeping the intensely cold liquid fuels insulated from each other, it was keeping both of them from boiling in the hot Florida sun. We insulated the liquid hydrogen tank in the early days with a honeycomb insulation. We put it on in big vacuum chambers and we sucked the, the honeycomb down onto the metal, pulled it tight and let the adhesive set. But all through the early stages, we had problems with the honeycomb insulation popping off the vessel. The engineers realized they were doing something wrong. To fix it, they would need specialist help. We were manufacturing the vehicle at Seal Beach in Southern California. And Seal Beach is a big surfing town. And we found that the surfers had been using honeycomb insulation to make their surfboards, and they were very skilled at using it. And we finally started hiring the surfers and they did a great job with it. The only downside of those guys was that when the surf was up, they was a big absentee problem. They were out there doing their trick. But they were a great bunch of guys, and they, they really brought a unique skill to the space program that I don't think we appreciated at the time until it was pretty well over. The Saturn V's third stage was also under construction in California at the Douglas Aircraft Company. The third stage had the job of propelling the Apollo spacecraft out of Earth orbit on a trajectory to the moon. Among the engineers working on it was Don Brinka. Well, the third stage for us at, at Douglas was uh, one of the biggest stages we've ever made. It was uh, 20 feet, 22 feet in diameter. As with every part of the Saturn's hardware, testing was critical in ironing out the problems which had been overlooked. We were preparing to test the third stage at our facility, and I was a director of test operations. I was responsible for all testing. I was uh, sitting at my table in the control room, monitoring all the other events that were going on, and watching for any problems and following the countdown. The stage was fully tanked and fully pressurized. We were progressed satisfactorily up until the point moments before ignition. And when we had uh, a component fail, it was not hard to tell something was wrong. The whole blockhouse shook, everything rattled, and the screens all went white, and so we knew there was a major calamity. It was, uh, it was kind of a, a heart-stopping moment when that occurred, and we knew that the work was cut out for us to get this one resolved. 
Once the fire was out, the team began a painstaking investigation. 